Hello, everyone. We're back with another episode with Nate Winky. He's oh, yeah. here. I'm excited. Let's do it. And little fun fact, actually. <laughs> Last week, Friday, we were recording this same kind of episode, but at the end, when I pressed end record, the entire file got corrupted. It was my fault. I figured out what was going wrong, but this is round two, but I think it'll be a good one. Yeah, it's kind of, I guess we'll count it as our uh, test round, mm -hmm. um, which still is quite sad because yeah. it was a good, you know, hour and 40 minutes, but um, that way we'll be even uh, more focused for this one, I suppose. Yeah. So that's good. But yeah, the topics we dove into, we'll just, we'll just start right now. So yeah, no, we'll just reiterate. So, well, we both grew up in a similar s situation, high school and college wise. So we thought we would just give our background when it came to high school first and then college and then continue on. Mm -hmm. So what was your experience with Kelm well, Christian and all of that? Sure. Um, let's specify. So specifically though, we want to talk about our religious journeys. Yeah. So is that's that, that I'm hoping is the primary focus today. Um, what is interconnected with that and what we might get to is how our religious journeys and current religious thought process, let's say, are impacting our thoughts about church. And we'll see if we get there, but let's at least have that as part of the goal. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I do want to try to articulate um, my thoughts about, about high school, specifically within the realm of religion. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I can, I can just jump in. Yeah, sure, sure. So you and I both grew up um, at Kalamazoo Christian High School. And what did I meet you in sixth grade? Yeah. Something like that. And I, I wouldn't say we were really that good friends until freshman year of, of high school. Um, but, but for me specifically, um, at Kalamazoo Christian, it's a classical Protestant reformed Christian community with classical, um, you know, conservative Christian Protestant values. So it's pretty, you go to a Reformed church and more or less the doctrine of the Reformed church will be, you know, espoused in, in, in the Kalamazoo Christian setting. And so now I am very, very saturated in this world because my father is a Reformed pastor. And he, you know, he's been a pastor now for effectively 30, you know, 30 some years now, just about 30 years. And obviously throughout my childhood, that was, you know, it wasn't just a thing that we did on Sundays. It was constant because, you know, my father's coming home every day from church related things. And my mother was a, you know, elementary school teacher for quite a while. And then when we moved to Michigan, she shifted roles to be uh, essentially the children's director at the church. So I was heavily saturated in that worldview. And then <clears throat> you couple that with a very, very small Christian high school. And I was in a complete bubble of a worldview. And which isn't all a bad thing, but that's just the facts on the ground here. So Freshman year, um, and especially through middle school and stuff, I was kind of a mm, perfectionist. Like, I, I, I didn't want to ever do anything wrong. You know, I was like, I must get straight A's mm -hmm. uh, to kind of an insane degree, to actually an unhealthy degree. Um, but it was kind of just wired into me at the time. And I didn't have really much rebelliousness in me. I was pretty... I, I, was, I was a rule follower. I, I would basically do what I was told, etc. And then... Throughout sophomore year, I had a bit of a shift where you know I was able to drive um, early on in sophomore year because I was I was old for our grade, and my my mindset towards religion, church, my parents started to shift and it started to shift pretty quick. And how much of that had to do with you know the environment and me getting you know, annoyed with the environment or, or space that I was in and how much of that had to do with my inherent personality traits coming out. I don't really know. Um, but I started to become hyper rationalistic and I was also really high in a couple key personality traits that kind of pushed me in a, 
certain direction. And, and one of those is conscientiousness, which is essentially, um, this is kind of a poor way to describe it, but you know, how hard you work. I, I think it's better, better to describe it as not that you love working hard, but more that if you're not doing something productive, you feel miserable. And that's definitely how I felt. So what came of that was I was, uh, you know, we're, we're stuck in that school building for seven hours a day. And I was so, so sick of the content in high school that, specifically in the religious dimension, that I, you know, I felt like I wasn't getting meaning out of it. So the side of me that wanted to, you know, really tackle things and dig into things and work hard at things and be constantly wrestling with things wasn't able to really get activated as much as I wanted. And then another personality trait of mine is that I'm high in the, um, so there's the creative, there's openness to experience. And, and then in that openness to experience dimension, there's two dimensions. There's the creativity dimension and there's the intellect dimension. And the creativity dimension is more like art, creativeness, you know, how um, novel are you, essentially? How many novel ideas are you capable of generating? And the intellect dimension is more interest in abstract thinking. And I'm in like the 98th percentile for the intellect dimension. So I'm hyper interested in essentially the why behind things. So you couple my hyper interest in the why. Um, I'm a relatively deep thinker. I'm hyper rational. And I was starting to get hyper critical of the people and the institutions around me. And what that culminated in, especially my junior year, was a certain level of cynicism and basic, basic nihilism. Um, and I can describe what I mean by nihilism because a lot of people probably are not familiar with that term. And essentially, the classical definition is that it's when someone believes that life is fundamentally meaningless. Now, I don't really think that's what nihilistic people mean. I don't think they think life is meaningless. I think they think that given the absolute catastrophe of existence and the suffering that comes along with our limited selves, it's difficult to imagine that due to that negative meaning produced by that suffering, that there's any positive meaning that can supersede that or justify that. And that's certainly what I meant. I was overwhelmed by how arbitrary the universe was, by how much I didn't know, by how much my worldview was based upon what my parents and my community were saying, how many questions I had. And then part of that also was a genuine problem with what I thought was a reduction of certain fundamental questions about God, faith, um, religion, um, prayer, basically a reduction of the religious dimension to quick, not very well thought out, surface level discussions and answers. And what bugged me so much about that is I was striving to understand the why behind things and understand the deeper meaning behind things. And yet I felt like that conversation wasn't being had. And and I and I and, and that made me rather cynical about the, the whole thing. It made me suspect of the institution as a whole and, and high school as a whole. So I was I was going through this hyper rationalistic, nihilistic period of my life where I was essentially questioning everything. And I and I my worldview, you know, really really struggling to maintain solidity. I was struggling to hold on to a, a solid worldview um, and a solid purpose in life. And what ended up happening was, well, a number of things. Um, partway through my junior year, I got heavily interested in a man behind us named Jordan Peterson, whom introduced me to certain books that I got deeply, deeply invested in reading. Um, and one of, one of those books, or, or I guess let's just stay broad, the general, several of the books were deeply focused on the reality of evil and suffering in the world. And when I, when I explored into those topics, actually, let me take one step back here real quick, um, coupled with my nihilistic state about, okay, well, is there true positive meaning in life? You know, the suffering of the world is you know, such a catastrophe 
that how can we how can we live with purpose essentially um, part of that also was a a big part of that was a moral relativistic bent to my moral framework and what I mean by that is that moral relativ relativism essentially posits that there cannot be true right and wrong there is no absolute truth there is an absolute morality um, morality is purely a subjective game based upon your culture, your subculture, how you were brought up. You can't criticize someone's, you know, thoughts about morality because you don't know their experience, etc. And I didn't ever really go that far with it, but I certainly was questioning whether or not something could be truly um, right or wrong in, in, a, in an absolute sense. And what 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 changed me on that wasn't wasn't by looking at the good it wasn't by looking at people around me that that were claiming that you know god that that, that god loved me or that jesus had a plan for me or that you know uh, everything was going to be okay it, it was by looking at the most awful evil things i could possibly imagine that convinced me that right and wrong must exist. It was almost like I, I had to believe in the devil before I could believe in God. And that's exactly what happened. Um, so now we go back to the books, and one, one of the more influential books was, was the Gulag Archipelago, and it's a, it's a recount of the absolute catastrophe of the Soviet state under Stalin. And Many people don't know this, but the greatest killers of humanity, uh, well, were in the 20th century, so our most recent century, and, and they weren't under fascism, they weren't under Hitler. Hitler don't, don't get me wrong, Hitler was, you know, was about as evil as they come, but in terms of sheer numbers of deaths, con communism in both Stalinist Russia, but more specifically in Maoist China, um, the estimates vary widely, but... Um, probably at least a hundred million people in the 20th century died as a direct result of communistic totalitarian states um, with the majority being under Mao and Mao's China. Stalin killed plenty too, but when you're counting in the millions of corpses, your point is already made. So reading about what happened in those places and just the depths of human malevolence and human evil convinced me that I couldn't live in a moral relativistic framework anymore. Even if I didn't know what was good, I certainly knew what was evil. And that gives you a place to stand. That gives you some solid ground. And I had no solid ground. I was deeply wrestling with what was true, what I believed in, whether there was true goodness in the world, what my direction in life should be, how exactly people were generating the theses and the uh, conclusions they had come to about fundamentally metaphysical and unknowable things in the religious dimension. And yet, reading about those catastrophes, reading about just how dark it got, changed me fundamentally, psychophysiologically, and I've never recovered from some of the things that I've read. And as dark as it was, it was absolutely necessary. And if I had not have done that, I could have seen myself go down a very, very different path. Some of the, some of the stories within those books go into some of the fundamental motivations for, for evil and one of the primary motivations for evil is when someone becomes bitter and resentful and I saw that be expressed in the people that committed the, the atrocious acts in those stories and I, and, I, and I tried to look a little bit deeper and say okay well what what motivated them to get resentful and bitter what was the 
fundamental conclusion about reality that they came to that they used to justify the heinous crimes that they were committing. And the fundamental reality was a, or the, the fundamental conclusion they came to about reality, rather, was a nihilistic, anti-responsibility, anti-meaning, vengeful, bitter conclusion. Essentially, they, they were going down, intellectually, a similar path that I was myself. And their nihilistic conclusions about the world that who the hell is going to care in a hundred years about what you did and how good you were, their conclusions about the fact that life had no true inherent good meaning and that morality was purely subjective, that thought pattern brought about those evil acts. And, and I thought to myself, so you're so overwhelmed by the suffering and level of arbitrary limitation and death in the world. Your conclusion is that life has no inherent meaning. And as a result of that conclusion, you produce nothing but more of the very thing that brought you to that conclusion in the first place. It's a purely cyclical, circular pattern. And it seems to destroy its own argument, and is kind of what I came to, is that if your initial complaint causes a conclusion that produces nothing but more of the initial thing that you were complaining about, that seems to be a self-defeating hypothesis. And then, looking at that, lo looking at that, and truly looking inside of myself and realizing that I had the capacity to go down that road, and looking at the darkness made me believe in the light. And that's what I mean when I say I believe in God. I'm not talking metaphysical God. I'm not talking a literal being. We can get into that, and, and that's a different discussion as far as I'm concerned. I'm talking about a pragmatic version of God. I'm talking about a God of truth, a God of morality, of, of something absolute that in my life I focus on as true and have to run towards. And here's another interesting concept that really, really changed me, and it, it goes along with this, the same thought pattern, is it's difficult to always know what to pursue. It's the same idea with, like, okay, what is good? Like, it's not always easy to think, okay, well, what should I aim for? What's my goal in life? What should be the point that I focus on? That isn't always clear. But what you can do is you can look and say, okay, in what particular ways, if I allowed myself, would I degenerate into the person that I don't want to be? Just how bad could I become? And you can, you can really think about that. You can think about that your entire life. And when you go down that road and you realize just how awful it can get, you may not know what to pursue, but you know what to run away from. And that's huge. Because if you know what to run away from, that's some serious motivation to run away from hell and towards heaven. And those were some of the conclusions that I was, well, coming to and then wrestling with, um, specifically my junior year and especially my senior year. And what what made that process particularly difficult for me was I felt incredibly isolated in that journey. I didn't feel like the answers I was seeking were to be found in the people that I was surrounded with. And I didn't feel like I could articulate to people around me beyond a select few what I was thinking and they would actually genuinely understand. And part of the consequences of my psychological state at the time was that I was not always fun to be around. <laughs> so to anyone that had to live with me through my junior and senior year of high school, I, I apologize, but I was wrestling with some serious questions and didn't feel like 
I could go to people around me in the way that I wanted to. Um, and I also didn't feel like the discussion that needed to be had, the, the, the level of seriousness of a discussion that needed to be had about religion, faith, God, etc., and defining what those things mean for you personally, pragmatically, in a absolute sense, in a metaphysical sense, all that comes with that, I didn't feel like that was really being hashed out. And that made it even more frustrating for me, because I thought, if there's any place that this should be happening, it should be here. And I, and I would watch friends around me, and I would, and I would think, there needs to be more depth to this, including for myself, of course. But I, but I was thinking, we need more depth here. We need something, we need something more solid. And let me go one more place real mm -hmm. quick. One of the other books, I read several books on essentially the reality of evil. Um, but one of the other books that I read that, that touched on this to a certain extent was Beyond Good and Evil, aptly named, by Friedrich Nietzsche. And he, he actually predicted what happened in the 20th century in terms of um, the absolute catastrophe of ideological, tyrannical states such as the Soviet Union and Maoist China. And, and he had this particular quote, um, which most people are at least somewhat familiar with, where he essentially declared the death of God. And what most people don't realize about this quote is that they failed to read the next sentence where he essentially says that we will never be able to wash away the blood. It was no triumphant proclamation um, at all, in fact. It was, it was one of deep in profound sadness and, and depression, essentially, that, that he came to, where essentially he, he made the case that the, the rational enlightenment philosophy that was exponentially accelerating in the 19th and 20th centuries was so powerful that it was going to destroy, essentially, our fundamental religious systems and our fundamental conceptions surrounding morality. And what would be a consequence of that is two things. One, that we would degenerate into ideological, tyrannical states, which did, in fact, happen. And two, that we would be forced to create our own values. And... The, the second part of that, the force to create our own values, I actually think he got wrong, and Carl Jung, a uh, famous psychologist, came along at the end of the 20th century. I may have gotten that timeline wrong, but he, but he came along and he essentially said, um, we actually aren't the sort of creatures that can create our own values. But, but back to, uh, I'll take one step back again, um, part of that discussion of values and morality and you know believing in an absolute truth and the death of god part of that discussion was another quote that he's that he um, said which is for those who have a why can bear any how and that encapsulates essentially my my thought process to to a decent degree and that i needed a why i needed a reason i needed something that i could stand on and not criticize rationally that was something uncontrovertible. And I found that by reading the darkest things I could possibly find, which convinced me of the reality of evil, and convinced me that my conclusions about nihilism, my conclusions about the lack of absolute truth in the world, had to be wrong or there was no way to live. So, <laughs> well, one quick quote yeah. from that Gulag archipelago that really captivated me was that the line between good and evil runs down the heart of every man, yeah. and that that puts it into perspective, because sometimes you read history like that and you say, oh, all those Nazis, all those communists, they were just bad people, and they, I would never do something that they were doing. Oh, yeah. But then you read that book and then you're like, hmm, what if I was in that situation? Every single human has the capacity for evil, just like they were. But also, we all have the capacity for good. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. You, it's very useful to recognize that you can do things that are very evil, 
But like Nate says, when you realize that you can do things that are evil, it gives you a great platform to run away from. Because if you're running away from your your evil self, you then become a better version. And it looking at it in that way has was really useful for me. Exactly. And th this is the beautiful thing about it, is it actually also makes the reality of good so much more real. Is is suddenly s suddenly <laughs> You, you, you can actually believe in, in a true goodness, in a, in a true um, pathway to heaven, shall we say. Um, which brings that m a much deeper level of solidity that we need in life. And that's part of what I was searching for. Um, so that, to a decent degree, kind of... Obviously, there's probably a million things I left out because it's insanely complicated. But that, to a decent degree, encapsulates my, let's call, religious and philosophical and moral journey through my high school years. And then when I got to college, um, I definitely still developed, and I'm very different now, three years later, you know, my junior year at Western Michigan University. But my, the more radical shifts in my thought process occurred my junior and senior year of high school. And I wanted to give you a chance to talk about, well, first your, your high school experience, but then also more specifically your college experience, because I know that for me, high school was the primary changing point, let's say. Um, but for you, I think college probably was a greater changing point. Yeah. That's the right term, but that's accurate. You, yeah. you get what I'm saying. So mm -hmm. describe high school a little bit for you, if, if you would. So, yeah. Well, I feel like... In Kalamazoo Christian, as a young 17, 16 year old, no one, maybe besides you, were really realizing that, hey, we are in a bit of a bubble. There's everyone here subscribes to the same religion, but there's so many other religions out there, there's so many other opinions, and but I just don't think that was highlighted very much. Like, chapel every week was a very, very optimistic message about how loving God is and how if you accept Jesus into your life, your life will be so fulfilled. And that I heard that message a lot, but it was never defined in ways that were tangible. It was a lot of, I have this question, and then they had this one or two sentence answer of believe in God and have faith and Jesus will save you. And those kind of answers, and it... It honestly, to me, it just didn't, it didn't captivate me very much. Yeah. I wasn't that interested in going to chapel. I wasn't that interested in even talking about religion because I thought the depth of religion just was those kinds of discussions, which yeah. were, oh, just have faith in Jesus and love God and God loves you and, oh, life is so good. And it was just this, it seemed like a Sunday school type answer a lot of the time, and I can't straw man because we got into some deeper things, of course, but mm -hmm. for the most part, when you ask people what they thought about it, there wasn't much depth, including myself, mm -hmm. I'm sure, and it just, I saw so many, well, I saw there was, there's a few different types of people that I saw who were going to K Christian. The first group were, was, a, I think, a minority, in my opinion, who were so engaged in the chapel services, who absolutely loved the messages and who were on fire for what they were having to say. Like, I could yeah. see some people who were truly on fire for that type of message. Yeah. And by all means, that's fine if they are. Mm. But I also saw, I think, a larger majority of people who, who were just not interested at all in yeah. going to chapel. Why are we going to this dang chapel? I'd rather just sleep in. It's a waste of time. It's not motivating me. It's not mm. captivating me. There's, mm. It's just, we're singing and then we're talking about a similar message. And and I can't, like I got to be careful not to straw man because I'm not going to remember every single message and every speaker that came in might have had said different things, but there wasn't much of a, of a why really. Yeah. Oh, we're all so happy. What's the why? Jesus is the why. And it's like, well, what does that really mean when you're, how do you apply that to your actual actions in your yeah. everyday life? And it just, it didn't give me much of a foundation, to be honest. But what really helped me 
was asking questions of why, especially in college. I didn't really realize it, but after K Christian, if someone, well, let's say this. I noticed that there was this kind of question that was posed upon people in that community, which was, are you a Christian? Do you have a good relationship with God? And if you said, yes, I'm a Christian, that box was checked and you could move on and you could go eat your ice cream and have fun. But if you said, no, I'm not, I'm struggling, or no, I'm not, <laughs> and there... Well, what does that mean? Yeah, like, there wasn't much of a, are you struggling with what we're saying right now? Or do you have any deep questions? Do you have any doubts about all of this? Or uh, there just wasn't much of a, why do you believe that, why do you, why do you say you're a Christian, Nate? Let, explain to me why you would say you're a Christian. If an atheist came up to you on the street and said, what do you believe? What, what's your religion? And then said, why? Could you answer it succinctly with, that would actually maybe captivate them in any way? Or would you just say a one sentence answer that is basic and doesn't really explain much? And so I just, I just saw that the question of why wasn't really asked much. Yeah. And once I got to college, I started to ask the question, why do I say I'm a Christian? What does that even mean? And we were, instead of being in a bubble of Christian reformed people, hello Bailey. <laughs> Sorry, the dog, the dog is with us today. Mm -hmm. So hopefully she'll be, she'll be reasonable. Yes, thank you. But yeah, going, going to college was a completely different experience, Western Michigan compared to Kalamazoo Christian because most people there don't talk about religion no. or they have di completely different opinions about religion. They might have grown up on a different geographical location. Oh, yeah. True diversity and in the true sense of the word. Exactly. And I found myself not saying, oh, I'm a Christian. You should believe in Jesus. Yeah. Because honestly, know. I don't think it would captivate people, especially our age. I, I don't think it, it didn't captivate me, that kind of message. So what I... What I found, I was searching throughout this year and the next year, which is... Freshman year? You mean? Yeah, freshman okay. year. Yep. Why, why would you say you're a Christian? What does that mean? And what does God mean to you? And yep. all of those questions really helped me. And I guess a few questions before... Let me step back a little bit, I guess. Sure. Which is one thing that I realized... I just did a quick Google search. How many people in the world say that they're Christian? And the answer was like, I don't know, less than 2 billion people. And there was like 7, peop 7 billion people on earth then. And I was like, 30, 35% of the world say that they're Christian. And I'm like, that's just the people that say they're Christian. What does that even mean when it comes to their actions? Does that mean that they actually are Christians in the real sense? I don't know. But in saying the sentence, oh, I believe Jesus is my savior and he's going to forgive all my sins and anyone who does not believe in him shall not have eternal life. And it's like that sentence is very, very optimistic to so many people, especially in those chapel services and at church. I would hear that message a lot. But to me, and I think to Nate, it was a completely terrifying statement because it then sent billions of people to hell, whatever that means, after life, who may have never even had the chance or who grew up in a completely ge different geographic location, who believed in different things, whose parents hammered down a different religion. And it, I just, yeah, I just had to take a step back there and say, yeah. hmm, before I just completely say that I'm a Christian and I'm going to stand on it and I'm going to proclaim it, I had to do some digging. And that was the first part that really kind of shattered me was that mm -hmm. statistic of how many people actually say they're Christians. Mm -hmm. And so then and real quick, the, that, that statement, you know, the, the classical statement, you know, espouse with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and Savior, I forget what verse that is specifically, and you will be saved. Um, it, it was, one of my issues with it is, is not the verse itself, but was that only the positive side of the verse was ever focused on, is what it felt like. It is we were completely leaving out the implications of what that actually meant. And the implications of what that meant 
terrified me out of my skull to such an extent, made me so absolutely cynical about the religion as such, and this hypothetical loving God that deeply cares about you and me, but apparently doesn't care about the other five billion people that didn't happen to grow up in Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo, Michigan, in a Christian environment with a pastoral father of the perfectly correct religious state. I mean, the level of arbitrary lottery that that implies, just on its face, is so terrifying when you consider the metaphysical ramifications of the statement such that when all you hear is about the positive side of it, it makes the whole thing suspect. You're like, what is going on here? That we, we are completely ignoring something that we need to talk about right now. And why aren't we all sprinting to the nearest non-Christian in our utter conviction and telling him or her, you need to listen. So it, it, it was like we were taking the most fundamental statement you could possibly make about moral, or reality and brushing over it and also just pointing at one side of the equation such, such that I was skeptical of the entire thing. And you're, you're pointing to that. And that is, that is the, I don't know, the, the three minute cynical version of that. And, and there's like three hours that we could dig into that statement in and of itself. But that was the, that was the reaction slash that was part of the, the wrestling that I had. So, it, no, you're, you're encapsulating perfect. I want you to keep going. But, sure. But I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. And another thing that really changed me was listening to a few lectures of Jordan Peterson where he asked, well, he's, he's been, he got famous very quickly and he talked a lot about morality and philosophy. And yeah. so of course he was, a ton of people were posing him the question, Hey, do you believe in God? Are you a Christian? And he honestly, he was saying that he wasn't the hugest fan of that question. And I was like, what do you mean? But then he recorded this two hour lecture, two of them in a row about what that even means to him or just seems to mean from a psychological perspective. And so like, he's like, okay, do I believe in God? Well, there's two questions I have about that question. First question, what do you mean by believe? And what do you mean by God? Yeah. And when he said that, I was like, oh man, <laughs> I've never asked those questions in my entire life. But I've said that statement probably a hundred times over my life. I made profession of faith when I was like 16, maybe 14, I don't remember. And, but I've never asked those questions. And I was like, that just, that, that blew my mind. And it, but it also widened my horizon. And I think it made me really start to define what those things mean. And so, and then I started to think, okay, let's first talk about what do we mean by believe when people say that? And I feel like to a lot of people, saying that they be, saying that they believe in God is what believe me belief means yeah. in some sense. Yeah. It's the words. It's those six words com in that correct order. I believe in God and Jesus Christ, His Son, and those words mean that you're a Christian in some sense. From what I could tell from the from what we learned in high school, and. And I was like, that just doesn't seem to cut it for, for me, at least. But what were you going to say? No, no, I, I agree. I agree. Um, obviously, that wasn't the sole focus no. of all of the messages. But it certainly was the primary focus. I mean, I mean that's, I would say, inarguable. Is, is, you know, the level of focus given to what evidence of true belief actually constituted was abysmal, in my opinion. Um, and... It was, I guess what really bugged me was just the the flippancy and the casualness at which fundamental, fundamentally unknowable metaphysical things were said on a regular basis that had absolutely terrifying consequences, if true, and hugely optimistic consequences. And we just focused on that as, if you believe in God, if you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you're simultaneously condemning billions of people to eternal suffering. Now, that is the quick, cynical version of an answer to that question. Mm -hmm. I have, again, three hours worth or more, well, 
what should be multiple books to answer those questions and what that statement really means mm -hmm. um, about heaven and hell and it gets it gets very complicated so that I just want to make it clear that I'm not saying that that is my conclusion about that statement however that is a conclusion and that is a initial reaction to the statement that needs to be taken into account is okay well how do we how do we conceptualize this belief thing how do we conceptualize this god thing let's define god let's define belief what is true evidence of belief is it what you say or what you do and or both or both most and, likely and both. most likely both but when push comes to shove what is true belief what truly what truly encapsulates belief and to me that's that's your actions no doubt about that um can i quick go one place sure one of one and let's take one more step back one of peterson's um let's say conclusions and the specific one of the specific uh lectures he did it was titled who dares say he believes in god so highly recommend looking that up i'll throw um, that in the description yeah, if you want to chuck the link in there that'd be good very good one but um one of his uh okay so who dares say he believes in god one of his conclusions about that was that he he, he, he couldn't he couldn't distinguish that statement from a claim to moral knowledge or moral superiority and he was struggling to do that with while trying to be humble and um, let's say realistic about his own state in life and I didn't articulate that perfectly but let me go to where I was gonna go one of the things that I encountered when I would read um, some of the the absolute catastrophes that happened in our past one book specifically was uh, man's search for meaning by Viktor Frankl mm. and Viktor Frankl lived through the Nazi death camps and w one of the things he's a psychologist and one of the things that he focused on was he hyper focused in on the people that while in the camps refused to corrupt their souls. They they refused to become evil. They refused to say things that weren't true. They would not play the game of <coughs> conformity. Conforming to the evil around them. They refused to do so. Even in the most the most awful circumstances imagined, they refused to play that game. And he said, watching those people made me completely skeptical of <coughs> what I was saying and whether or not what I was saying was true. And he said, maybe maybe those are the people that can claim that they know God, that can claim that they actually truly believe. Because when push came to shove, they actually acted it out. And that is an extreme standard. Don't get me wrong. It, it, it certainly is. And one of the things that Nietzsche said also was that the only true Christian died on the cross. And again, that that's an extreme statement, but it's worth it's worth considering for a second. And it's worth thinking about before you declare your belief in God. And that that level of seriousness to that statement changed me forever. And I thought that was a important point. So yeah, and there's only a few people I can think of that that truly seem to act out the aspects of Christ. One of them being your dad. But a f I know a few other people that I feel like they can say it, and I'm like I respect that when they say it. But there's some people who say it, and I'm like I just get a little cynical and a little skeptical, and I just I want them to think about it a little bit more, including me, <laughs> like before I say it. So I don't say it. Yeah, I know. I would. It's tough to say because of those implications and because of that weight that comes with that. And so I just, I'm trying to encourage people to start thinking about what do you yeah. mean by believe? Sit and ask yourself that for a year or more. And so then we get to the next topic, God, defining sure. God. And that one is many podcasts, many books, <clears throat> many 
so many. Yeah, you know, that takes forever to define. Yes, but it does. like you said before, there's a few different ways in which you can view God. One being a metaphysical God, a God up in the sky who's listening to this very discussion right now, who is judging the good and the evil, and who is sending some to hell and some to heaven, and who sent his son down, Jesus. And, and who individually cares about your thoughts and actions at every, every given moment. Mm -hmm. Who's also counting them and keeping track of your sins, by the way. And so there's that metaphysical <clears throat> version, and also the pragmatic, practical version that you can define uh, almost logically and rationally and in earthly terms that, that makes sense in, from psychological terms in, in, in some yeah, sense. Yeah, in, in moral and value terms. Yeah. And that, if I may, sure. that distinction is, was, was absolutely critical for me in conceptualizing um, what God meant for me, what belief meant for me, because the, the metaphysical dimension, the um, literal being of God, is, well, at one level, fundamentally unknowable. That doesn't mean you can't talk about it, but it, it becomes immensely complicated and tricky to make truth-based statements, because essentially none of our human tools work. None of our human tools work in that dimension. Evolutionary biology, rationality, pragmatism, psychology, psychology logic, basically none of them work. And that doesn't mean you can't try to apply them. That doesn't mean you can't have that conversation. It's an important conversation to have. Mm -hmm. Yet, what's so infuriating about that conversation is a lot of the answers surrounding conclusions about the metaphysical God come from fundamentalistic or dogmatic approaches to reading scripture. And I do want to get into that. Sure, we can. And, and we certainly can. Let me take one step back, yep. though, about pragmatic versus metaphysical, yes. and then we can get into that. Mm -hmm. So that's that was one of my personal problems with it, is that the distinction between the metaphysical God and then the pragmatic God was never made. And the pragmatic God is essentially, okay, well, what are, look at your actions, or rather lack of action, and, and what, what, what are you ultimately aiming at? What, what, is, what do you accept as true, as right, as good in your life that you're actively working towards? That's your God. What is your ideal? Yeah. What are you striving for? What are you aiming at? What exactly. is the ultimate ideal? Mm -hmm. And that's something that you can apply the tools of rationality, logic, evolutionary biology, all of those other tools to, and we can actually have a conversation about. And... When I, when I read about the absolute catastrophe of the Soviet state, what I mean when I say is I believe in the devil is I believe in evil. Mm -hmm. And what I mean when I say I believe in good is I believe in God. Yeah. And I don't... I have questions about metaphysical God, and we can talk about that, but I do act as if God exists in a moral sense, or at least try to, is the better way to say that. Um, because... I do believe in right and wrong, and what I'm pursuing in a pragmatic, practical sense is a conception of value and morality that is centered on a fundamental truth in God. And that distinction is rarely made, and that was the most useful thing for me, because I said, okay, I can still have questions about metaphysical God. But that doesn't mean I have to throw away the entire game of morality and values and what is ultimately true and good and evil. In fact, all that does is solidify those things to make them even more real. And then I can also have a conversation about metaphysical God. Mm -hmm. And that was huge for me, personally, <clears throat> because I could separate those two. Because it was so hard for me to believe in both at the same time. And that caused a lot of strife for me personally, and I know for you as well. It actually made me cynical about the whole religious game. Because... I, I thought the moral wisdom and truth that was being spoken a lot was true, and in terms of the ethic of Jesus Christ and the conception about morality, I thought I thought were true. But I had serious questions about the metaphysical God, and that caused problems for me because it's difficult to distinguish between the two. So I don't know if that mm -hmm. I don't know if you have anything yeah, to add to that. I do slightly. There's this idea of the butterfly effect, which really oh yeah, I know you love this. This is my one of my favorite. loves this, which is. So, every single action you make has consequences, 
consequences that you might not even realize. So many consequences and implications that you don't even recognize. And it's so it's like you have two choices. It's like you run into a fork in the road and you're like, hmm, okay, there's a person that's being a bit let's just say you're in a fast food window or no let's say you're getting fast food and the person is who's giving you your order is a little bit slow and you've waited a while so you have two choices you can a be patient or b be annoyed resentful or say something to because you're angry mm -hmm. it's like okay uh why did it take so long this is this is terrible service uh, or you could say Thank you so much for what you do. I appreciate it. Have a great day. And it's yeah. like, it, both of those things were only like one or two sentences of effort, but you just changed reality. This, the, the getting angry at the person changed reality in the sense that now he's going to be annoyed. Now he's going to take it out on others, hypothetically. And you probably just made the world a worse place, technically. And... Let's say, you take, let's say you take this other path, which is, wow, thank you so much for what you do. There's not enough people in the world who work at these places. I really I thank you because you make the world go round. And you, just a thank you. And they hear that and they're like, man, I haven't been thanked yet today. And wow, that really made my day. And now they're going to go home to their kids and they might even just be in a better mood. They, and they might treat their kids better. And it's just that... That single action, yeah. that single attitude, and that single look that you make towards people, it makes waves that you can't even realize, that you'll never see. But so that that thinking about God in that sense, it's like God is God is in me. I have the potential to, like I said before, do what is good or what is evil and when I, when I pursue what is good or what is ideal, I then make the world a better place. And the world is now tilted slightly more towards love, truth, beauty, and goodness. And that's exactly what God is in a technical sense when we're thinking about it in a moral, from a moral, mm -hmm. earthly lens with tools that we can actually use. Mm -hmm. Because when I say, oh, I said that kind word, God is smiling upon me. And it's like, I could view it like in that sense, the metaphysical God, but to me, it just doesn't captivate me. It doesn't motivate me near as much as thinking of God as just what every action you take is. God is within you. God is everywhere. God is everything. <laughs> and so it's kind of hard to explain and I'm not explaining it the best, but it, it's motivated me to really take a look at my actions and really question, really make me step back before I just make claims about re reality and what I believe and how the reality works. Mm -hmm. And so, but I've still been able to, in my opinion, make <clears throat> the world a slightly better place through my actions by modeling what Christ did and by modeling what God says is right. And it's made the world a better place. And so that pragmatic view of God has helped me a ton but and then I can actually tell people who are maybe atheists or who lived in a different location who don't subscribe to Christianity and I can explain it to them in those terms and whether or not they actually say oh I'm a Christian now it doesn't really matter in my opinion because they they might have taken in that lesson and now they're at, now they're realizing the importance of the butterfly effect and the importance of every single action that they take and and that's what I feel like Kate Christian should have highlighted more. What do you, okay, let's, let's say we're all Christians. How does that apply to our single actions? How does that apply to how you're taking your studies seriously? How does that apply to how you're treating people on the other team when you're playing a sport? Just sure. all of those things. And I'm sure they highlighted it some, but to me it just, it didn't highlight it enough. But No, it, was, it definitely was lacking. Um, I wanted to go back to um, dogmatism and, and fundamentalism mm. because I kind of just chucked out those terms and didn't define them, and it's definitely important to define your terms. So what, what I was alluding to was uh, basically two of my, well, fundamental problems with um, the modern church and people within the modern church in terms of interpretation of scripture. Um, so <clears throat> basically dogmatism is... Um, belief that cannot be questioned. 
So it's essentially when you take um, scripture and say, all right, let's look at this single verse. And because it says this in this single verse, that is ultimately true. And my interpretation of that verse is also ultimately true. And there's there's a danger in that because it's it's unfalsifiable. It's dogmatic. It's cannot be updated. Yeah, it can't be updated. Um, there's no the the the, the fundamental tenet of true science is false falsibility. Mm -hmm. False. I think I said that wrong, but um, it can be corrected. It can be updated. Whereas in a in a dogmatic lens of scripture, there is no updating process. So ba basically, that that limits you um, in in a huge way. And and I had a particular problem with that because you can imagine. So this 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 book called the Bible, right? So you can imagine that. One of the claims of this this of the Christian religion in terms of the Bible is that this book is essentially ultimate truth. It is absolute truth. This is the word of God. And I don't want to straw man that, but part of the implications of that is that it hypothetically holds vast wisdom. And I'm not even I'm not even saying that's not true, but that's one of the claims. But then where I when I run into problems is then so this this book that holds ultimate true or ultimate truth ultimate wisdom that has an unbelievable quantity of knowledge and moral moral wisdom in it okay so we have that and then people in the church say or, or people in you know Christianity say okay well then my interpretation of that fundamentally complex and insanely deep book is ultimately correct. And that's where I run into problems. Because those two cannot coexist. You cannot have a fundamentally wise and truth-filled book and then also have your interpretation of that book be perfectly correct without the ability to be updated. And that that is kind of a... That is one of my huge problems with um, a lot of what happens in a church environment slash in the, in the Christian faith. And fundamentalism is along the same lines. And essentially what, what happens is um, basically the Bible has a variety of different scriptures within it. So in Genesis, it's in story form um, meant to um, use the power of stories to articulate things about the origins of human consciousness and good and evil and things like that. And then you get into history and there's Psalms, which is poetry. You get into the gospels, which are historical accounts of historical events. And then you get to revelation. That's apocalyptic literature. And each one of those subsets of books in the Bible has to be read in accordance with that subset. You can't read apocalyptic literature as if it's fact, as if it's trying to recount an objective story about reality. That's a false reading of the Bible. That would be a dogmatic and fundamentalistic way to look at that, that book of scripture. And the same would go for something like Genesis, where, which, frankly, we should do an entire podcast Let's about. Let's do it. But you can't read a narrative, narrative, poetic story that's attempting to answer the fundamental questions about human existence as a scientific document, as a literal way of looking at the world. And that, to me, is such an obvious misreading. And yet, so many Christians have that perspective about Genesis. And my problem with that is that it it reduces the complexity and truth of something to a fundamentalistic view that misses the point entirely. So we really should do a whole podcast on dogmatism, fundamentalism, and Genesis specifically because young Earth, old Earth. Yeah, we we really should because that gets rather complicated. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of goodness and richness there. There is. But Taking a step back again to kind of the point I was trying to make is that there, there's a there there was a lot of dogmatism there was a lot of fundamentalism and those 
those those were so evident in so many different ways about fundamentally unknowable questions that had simple answers or, or seemed to have people proclaimed them as simple answers to these questions that it was infuriating for me because I felt like legitimate questioning of them was almost frowned upon and was not was accepted yeah, it was, and I was isolated yeah. as, as I had said specifically so that that was that was a big one that was a big one for me and I, I know a big one for you although you that was more of college when you started to question those things more. sure but honestly in the questioning how to read this verse what does this verse mean what is what does this verse mean and like playing the devil's advocate what if it means this what if it means that and trying to wrestle and grow that I feel like I've grown the most in asking these questions I haven't grown as much when I when I assume my interpretation is completely correct and I'm unable to update it or I am unwilling to talk to people who might think differently I, I grew the most talking to people who believed in other religions and who who may have not been interested in Christianity at all but and so yeah when you when you when you're looked down upon for questioning, like, or, or, or for saying, oh, I'm not sure if I believe, I don't, it's very complicated, it would take a while for me to explain, it's almost like a looked down on, like, oh, you aren't morally virtuous, you aren't, you aren't a good person, or, like, I get that vibe from some people, not all Christians, of mm -hmm. course, but yeah. definitely some, <clears throat> because I feel like some people just don't look, haven't ever been explained the complexity of it, and... <laughs> And sometimes ignorance is bliss, and when you have a s <laughs> hello, Billy. Sorry, the no. dog. The dog is just being hilarious right now. Hey, hey, you need to calm yourself. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> you wanna you wanna take a break here? Sure. Let's quick take a break, and I'll we're back from the break uh, from the dog, and <laughs> we're gonna quick wrap this episode up, which. So we were we were talking about the importance of well questioning what you think and asking why do you believe and what do you mean by believe and those kinds of things and two or there's four videos that really helped me and I think helped Nate you showed them to me mm -hmm. which are two hour discussions each between Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris and Harris he's a he's a pretty famous atheist but they sat down to discuss and debate morality and how to interpret it and the value of religion and sometimes the non-values of religion and just the pros and cons of mm -hmm. all of that and that truly <coughs> changed me in a good way in my opinion and what do you have to say about all that oh it just it, it, sam harris is basically the foremost atheist philosopher you could even say and um, he's an incredibly intelligent guy and he what, what's so interesting about the first discussion that he and Peterson have is just the amount of things that they agree upon and putting putting metaphysics metaphysics aside in terms of values in terms of the necessity of moral truth in terms of the importance of humility they com they both agree on these things and that first episode specifically kind of helps to outline um, the commonalities that they have and it's kind of a it's an optimistic episode in a lot of ways because it, it's it's easy to consider you know atheists or people of other religions let's stick with just atheists as you know having no conception of morality and and, and that sort of thing but but Sam does an excellent job of articulating um, that he does actually believe in moral truth. And he and Peterson essentially disagree on where that truth comes from. But nonetheless, the discussion is extremely useful. And they specifically get into dogmatism and fundamentalism. And I did a subpar way of articulating that earlier. And I'm sure we'll do an actual episode on those two because that would be very useful. Um, but they do an excellent job of kind of outlining what those terms mean and uh, how that how that impacts um, their conceptions of morality and values and, and stuff like that. So, highly recommend those discussions. They actually do four of them, mm -hmm. um, each two hours long. So it's it's a lot of content, but oh, it's so worth it. Yeah. So, I, growing up in a Kalamazoo Christian environment, 
When I heard the word atheist, I almost had put those kinds of people in a box of, oh, they aren't good people, they, they're sinners, they, they're lost. The, those, that kind of idea was in my head. Mm -hmm. But then hearing that and seeing how they had so much common ground when it came to how they viewed the world and how they acted in the world, mm -hmm. it changed my thought on that. And I was like, wow. Every person is just a human, and they might say one thing or the other, but they still have value, and they still, they're still worth talking to, in my opinion. You shouldn't just isolate yourself from atheists. I feel like, as a Christian, you should be learning from the other side, or the, from other perspectives, because that's, that's how one grows, technically. This directly relates to the point you were making earlier, and one of the central points here, which is uh, understanding the why. And... It's absolutely critical to understand a different person's perspective and, and a more atheistic perspective about values, the world, God, etc. if you ever hope to fully understand your own perspective. And one of the points we made earlier was that if you don't have an opposing opinion, if you never ask why, if you never are challenged on your belief structure, then the depth at which your belief structure goes is rather shallow. And that was one of my primary concerns while in high school, was that without opposition, with the same message being over, told over and over again, you, you reduce the question, you, you reduce the complexity of the question, and you risk making the whole game suspect and the, and the, whole, the whole framework collapse if you don't have genuine opposition to um, flush out your own ideas. There's, there's this idea that, um, you know, your, your worst enemy can, can point out your flaws and is actually your best friend in the sense that when, when someone, when you're having a genuine discussion with someone, um, they're, help, they're capable of pointing out your own biases in the own ways that you're missing the mark or making an error. And that helps you to update your mental map and your perspective. And without that opposition, without that critique, without that constant updating, um, your beliefs can become stagnant and they can become um, lacking in nuance and complexity that is needed. So one of the beautiful things about um, specifically the discussion between Harris and Peterson is they're both masters in their fields and they're both extremely capable of articulating what they believe to be true and in an honest manner and a genuine way of wanting to find the truth and that that is so needed and as we were saying earlier is is critical in a discussion about belief God values your why because it needs that depth and it needs that complexity so it's 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 almost ironic it, it was about it was reading non-christian literature you know not explicitly christian literature by dostoevsky by um you know victor frankl um the gulag archipelago was written by alexander solzhenitsyn by reading those books is actually what was at least the tipping point or at least well the critical point let's call it in my own personal belief structure uh, in regards to Christianity and it made me much more convinced of the validity of well a lot of different things within within the Christian religion by looking at those sources outside of the traditional sources of the Bible and Christian philosophers and that doesn't mean you don't want those as well of course you do but if you never get an oppositional perspective or just another perspective you you take on a great risk of missing something and one of my one of one of my personal angsts at Kelms of Christian was that I saw a lot of people that I thought once they got to college would encounter a strong willed atheistic professor who would shatter their belief structure. And I thought, well, A, that's so sad, and then I also thought that's so unnecessary. Let's discuss the alternative perspective so people can generally come up with a why for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that was absolutely critical for me. And if I did not have that, I would not be in the place I am today. Not even close. I could have gone down a completely different path. So I guess that's probably one of the biggest points I was trying to make. And, and in general, one of the biggest things that we've realized mm -hmm. is the absolute necessity of alternative perspectives and genuine conversation towards the truth. And that's exactly what they do, or what specific, what specifically Peterson and Harris do in those series of talks, hence why we were 
referencing them. And I'm sure you can put the link for those in the description as well. Oh, well. Um, immensely useful, really mm -hmm. good. I don't know if you have any more to say about that. Yeah, we talked about well, we we talk about the idea of evangelizing and spreading the message and trying sure. to convince others and trying to captivate others to maybe believe what you believe, but. If you have never heard their perspectives or have never questioned your own, I don't feel like you have that much of a platform to be speaking on. You have you really have you encountered a hardcore atheist professor that you can debate on for a while? It's like if you haven't, if you can't, then that means you probably aren't a technical evangelist in in that sense. Because are you really captivating people to start thinking about maybe asking questions about Christianity and maybe? maybe accepting Christianity, it's like, man, I think that listening to other perspectives won't tarnish your faith. It will probably strengthen what you think about faith. It'll and force you to strengthen it, it will. or it will force it to decay. Uh-huh. And you don't want weak faith. No. You want strong faith. You hear it's this? not an easy process, No. But it, but it has to be done. You have to burn off the dead wood. You do. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's that's my encouragement to you all is to maybe think outside the box. Go to a few different other sources. Don't always go to a pastor at, for guidance. Go to them a lot, but use criticism. You Go to people who criticize Christianity because they might criticize something that is very true, a, a very true criticism, and they might really help update your perception, and they probably might even help your life and how you act. So... That's just kind of the encouragement because when you, when you're able to criticize your own thoughts and strongman the other people's perspectives, you then can negotiate with people from other perspectives and grow together and learn together. And you probably will teach them quite a few things if you're able to negotiate and give and take instead of being so dogmatic, so unwilling to update, and so certain that you have the exact interpretation of reality. It's like, that's not what grows people in relationship. That's no. not what forms a community. That's not what helps grow people's faith or people's journey. It's like the questioning is part of the journey. And without it, it's not a journey. It's childlike. Yes. And is a child ever going to convince you of how the reality works? Not, not, not really. So yeah, that's, I'm going to put those links in the description and I'm going to encourage you guys to start asking these questions. Maybe start start talking to people who might think differently because you're going to learn a lot and you probably will help them learn a lot. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, double whammy. But yeah. So, and you wanted to bring up this final point about... Sure, sure. Um, well, it's, I think it's probably... I'm running out of brain, mm -hmm. so it'd probably be good to wrap up here. Um, but... No, I think we covered a lot of good ground. Um, obviously, I'm hoping that a, lo a lot of the things that we discuss need many, many, many more hours of discussion because, you know, there's some things that we skipped over. Glossed slash, over. Glossed, glossed is the better word. Yeah. Right? That, you know, you, you don't want to reduce to having them be just glossed over. So that, I think we'll do that in the future, which is good. Um, but... Oh, it's just a, a final, more optimistic point I wanted to make, mm. which I think is I think is probably the, well, at least one of my central thesis theses about this entire topic in general, um, which is that there's this story in the Old Testament where um, Jacob is wrestling with God, and after that experience with wrestling with God, um, he actually gets he gets he's, he gets injured, but um, because well, who knows what that means? But one of the ways of thinking about what that means is there's no way to you know well wrestle with God without coming away uh, partly uh, partly injured. But what's so interesting about that story is that then Jacob's name is changed to Israel, and the true meaning of Israel is those who wrestle with God. And what's so interesting about that is, so the chosen people of God are those who wrestle with him. Not those who are meek, not those who say they love him without question, not those who are like sheep in a pen. Those who wrestle, those who struggle 
those who strive for truth, those who are willing to be exploratory and engaged in a real way. And there's something optimistic about that, that maybe the point isn't having all the answers. Maybe the point isn't complacency in saying the right things and living the right way in a perfect sense. Maybe the point is to wrestle. Maybe the point is to ask why and to genuinely struggle to find the truth because we don't know the truth. We don't know what is ultimately true. We're limited beings bound by death and suffering. We can barely con conceive of some of the things that we're trying to discuss. So, it's an optimistic point. The chosen people of God are those who wrestle with God. Those who struggle in a genuine manner. And that's what I'm trying to do. Not that I would ever claim I'm the chosen people of God. But that ethic, that, that struggle, maybe that is the point. Maybe that is where you find true meaning in life. Is, is in that wrestling, is in that that struggle. And that's something that I've always thought, um, well, something that always impacted me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people might hear us say, or hear us maybe critiquing or trying to criticize or trying to wrestle with religion and with God. But my goal, and I don't, Nate's goal, from what I can tell, is not to criticize out of resentment and out of spite and because, because we think it's all worthless. It's because I think we see the value in it and the value that comes when you do wrestle and when you do challenge your own opinions and when you do grow and learn from other perspectives. I, I'm trying my best to show that criticizing with love and care, knowing that there's a ton of value in it, has yielded positive discussions, deep relationships, and just growth on so many levels. So... <clears throat> I'm not trying to criticize this religion and Christianity out of spite and out of anger and and out of what's the right word? Malice. Malice. Yeah. So I think wrestling with a an open, humble heart is truly the right attitude. It's like I don't know everything. I honestly don't know enough, and I'm going to ask these questions and try to update my very narrow view of reality and that type of wrestling. Not a wrestling where it's like. I already have the correct interpretation. I'm, I arrogantly can assume that I am correct already. That type of wrestling doesn't yield positive results. And it's a humble wrestling that really does, in my opinion. So, mm -hmm. It's probably a good place to end it. Yeah. So, Farewell. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sticking around to the end of this episode. If you found this discussion meaningful or engaging... Feel free to give me a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Be sure to like, subscribe, share, comment on YouTube. Share this with your friends. If you found it meaningful, I'm sure they would too. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great rest of your day.